This is the Athletic FC podcast weekend preview. It's just 85 days until the European Championships begin in Germany. So we're going to look ahead to Euro 2024 with a particular focus on two of the favourites, France and England. I'm Michael Bailey and alongside me is our England correspondent Jack Pitt-Brook, who will be covering the Three Lions at this summer's tournament. Thank you very much for having me on the show, Michael. Lovely to see you, Jack. You uh, too. For the French angle, we have PSG, Brackets and Fulham writer Peter Rutzler. Bonjour, Michael. How are you? <laughs> Très bien, merci. <laughs> wow, I've actually impressed myself there with my French. Uh, and finally, for a, neutral, <laughs> neutral, for a neutral view of the cold, hard numbers, it's Tom Harris. Hello. Hi. Only facts from me today. Well, you've said it, so you will now have to stick to that. It's lovely to have you all here. Uh, as we stand, England and France are the bookies' favourites to lift the Henri Delaunay Cup. I think I pronounced that right. On July the 14th, uh, but I'm sure Germany, Spain, Portugal and defending champions Italy, maybe some others too, will fancy their chances. So let's crack on, starting with the Three Lions. It is, of course, the March international break. So we have fixtures and preparations. And for England, who we'll start with, they've got two friendly matches for Gareth Southgate side. They're at Wembley. They're against Brazil on Saturday the 23rd and then Belgium three days later on the 26th. Uh, Gareth Southgate has named a 26th man squad for these friendlies. Uh, that will, of course, be whittled down to 23 players come the tournament in June. So let's look at that squad and the notable inclusions one that was quite late in terms of Kobe Mainu. Uh, Jack, any of those names in the squad or perhaps the inclusion of Mainu sort of stick out to you? I think the f the fact that Southgate is still looking at inexperienced players this close to Euros is itself really revealing because it shows that he's determined to keep learning about players um, for this tournament and possibly even with an eye on what comes after the Euros. Um, he, it would have been easier, perhaps, for him to just choose experienced players and keep looking at guys who he's had in the England group over the last few years. And he hasn't done that. So I think there's a lot to be said for the inclusions of Konsa, Branthwaite, Mainu, uh, even players who've been involved a little bit, like Tony's obviously got one cap, Cole Palmer's got two gap, caps, and all those guys are now in contention to, to kind of make their case for inclusion on the plane to Germany. Ivan Tony's an interesting one because for me, he isn't necessarily in particularly good form. He has obviously been out and not played a lot this season as well, but was involved beforehand. So you can kind of see where, maybe where that's come back again. Uh, and then you have players like Cole Palmer, who's been a sensation this season. And I'm so delighted he's actually in this squad to prove a bit more about himself. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing is that England do already have quite a few kind of left-footed, creative winger type players like Cole Palmer. So obviously Bakari Saka's out there, Phil Foden can play on, on that right-hand side and drift into the middle. But yeah, you're right, he's definitely played himself into the squad at the very least. And I mean, just looking at the numbers, you know, from the Chelsea team alone, he's the club's top scorer this season across all competitions, 14 goals, the top assister with 12. So that's 26 goal contributions in around 30 full games this season, which is pretty extraordinary leads away for shots chances created passes into the penalty area through balls he's up there for take-ons progressive carries he's just it's quite amazing really the fact that he's played so little for City before moving to Chelsea and just kind of seamlessly like assuming this role in a team which is so kind of expensively assembled as well it's 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 really incredible that's a good point really it's quite a dysfunctional team at times as well so is is the Chelsea team a better team than an England first choice 11? Yeah, well, that's it, isn't it? I was just thinking that, you know, he's obviously done so so well coming out of City, having not played those games, gone into Chelsea, which is now, well, can I say this, a mid-table team? I've got the, mm -hmm. the Fulham link with the reporting. so uh, Get that dig in, Pete. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's true, you know, it's not been an easy period at Chelsea. Um, the pressure there, the, the, the amount of change that they've had there, and, and to be the guy, the guy who's carrying them, um, says a lot about how well he is performing and... You know, the, those numbers do speak for themselves. To produce that in that environment speaks well about what he could do, particularly in an England setup where it's a whole new level of pressure. Jack, you were at the England Media Day on Wednesday. How was that? Who did you get to hear from? Uh, yeah, it was good. So, Joe Gomez spoke. Obviously, this is the first time he's been in the England squad for years. And Southgate's been a big fan of him for a long time, but injuries have got in the way a bit. But he was back. Anthony Gordon spoke. Um, he's someone who's trying to stake a claim with his fantastic form for Newcastle United. And then we also spoke to Jared Branthwaite, who 
is in his first England group. And it was really interesting hearing from him. You know, he talked to us about how he nearly had to give up football at the age of 15 when he was just uh, a teenager at Carlisle United, had really bad tendonitis in his knee, couldn't play for 18 months, um, was only offered a four-week trial where he could pr- prove whether he was fit enough for a scholarship, at which point he was thinking, this isn't going to work out for me. But uh, his parents pushed him to do the trial. He did well in the trial, got a scholarship, got a professional contract, and then a few months later got his big transfer to Everton, uh, which is just a reminder of how, uh, how chal- you know, even for players who are now in the England squad and shining in the Premier League, it's often been a very difficult route to get there. Yeah, too true. The players that haven't made it, in terms of this squad at least, I guess the key ones there are Calvin Phillips and Raheem Sterling. I mean, we've already spoken about Chelsea already. And uh, that was kind of fun at the weekend with Raheem Sterling. And I don't know, to me, there is a really interesting piece on Raheem Sterling written by our Chelsea writer Liam Toomey, which is definitely worth the read. Uh, But that kind of feels like done now. He hasn't been in the England squad for for a fair while. Calvin Phillips is interesting because he made his West Ham move, Pete, essentially to get back into contention. I mean, the fact that that has not gone well is probably worse for him than had he still been sat on the sidelines at Man City almost. Yeah, it's, it's curious that it's at this point where he's now out of Man City, he's you know into an environment where he's going to be playing more, that it's now that he's dropped out of uh, Southgate's squad and, and they're thinking. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting one because, you know, Southgate's spoken a lot about how that isn't the same depth in that number six position. He wants someone to hold that role. And you would think that if he can find some form, if he can get some momentum, it wouldn't take too much to get back into the setup. Um, he's, he's the right kind of profile that he's he's after. And I think I think there may be a bit of frustration there as well because obviously there's Declan Rice and, and Declan Rice is world leading as a, as, a, as a six, but we've seen him for Arsenal play a bit more box to box, a bit more with a bit more verticality, scoring goals, um, and you kind of need someone to to release him in in that way, and that's why you'd want someone as Phillips as almost an option to to rotate in those positions. So, yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure there'd be some frustration. I'm sure Jack can speak more about it, that he's not available, but just because of the lack of the lack of options in that six role. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? This this question of how best to use Rice, because traditionally, obviously, Rice has been a six for England that's when you know when he first came into the team in 2019 I think that was the question was is he going to be a defensive midfielder or a centre-back and so six was where he initially fitted into the England team and the idea you know he had like Henderson or back then more you know, even Lingard or Delhi would be playing in front of him who could push forward a bit more but as Pete says the more the more he impresses with his kind of box-to-boxness at Arsenal, his ability to score goals, his amazing physicality where he can really dominate opponents in their own half. I think the question does become, like, is there is number playing six the best thing for Declan Rice for England? Or could they bring in another six to get him to push forward? The problem is, the problem with this, sorry, is that there isn't really another obvious number six who can do that. Like, Phillips has kind of played himself out of contention a little bit because he struggled at West Ham. Mainu is an exciting option, but obviously incredibly inexperienced. It would be a big thing to throw him in. Henderson is kind of still in the picture, having got his move to Ajax from Saudi Arabia. But I, um, I, I, I don't think anybody knows really exactly where Henderson's level is at the moment. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. But it's exactly the kind of this is exactly the kind of dilemma that Southgate needs this international window so he can try and come up to some answers. Absolutely right, and this does factor into. What we were going to do now, I was going to ask you, you guys for your ideal 11s, who you'd like to pick for England's opening Euro 2024 match, which is against Serbia on the 16th of June. And it's kind of a fun exercise, really, uh, because you figure out where the problems are, or maybe where the strengths and weaknesses are, Tom. Yeah, I didn't enjoy this, to be honest. I don't, <laughs> I don't envy Gareth Southgate at the start of his tournament. But obviously, international football as well, it's about individual games and it's about preparing specifically for the opponents that you're going to play. So sometimes setups will be, you know, more, for example, you might want a more attacking midfield setup. You might want one which is, can absorb pressure and then hit on the break. All really depends what he's thinking. But I mean, for me, the back five is kind of the easiest to pick apart from maybe one of the centre backs I think it has to be Jordan Pickford for me um, just because of the experience that he has in the England squad and obviously Aaron Ramsdale has had his ups and downs this season he's obviously a very talented goalkeeper but I think Pickford is the one for me Luke Shaw at left back and I'd say Kyle Walker I think at right back just again 
in my team that I'm picking, it's quite a heavily kind of attacking left-sided team. So I'd want Walker as a kind of right side of centre back when when England have the ball in the pressing forward. And then the two centre backs, John Stones, and I've actually gone for Jared Branthwaite um, just because of. I mean, there's a really good article on the Athletic actually by uh, Jacob Whitehead who kind of outlines how brilliant he's been in terms of winning duels, in terms of progressive passing and all of that kind of thing. He's left-footed and he fits well on the left as well. So I think that's that's my back five. Anyone going to complain with the back issues there? We're going to break it into bits, obviously, at this point. Um, so I would have Maguire mm. over Branthwaite. I think that Maguire has been so consistent for Southgate and I, in tournaments especially. And I think that that ultimately will decide Southgate's mind for him. At left back, I mean, I like Shaw, but I'm, I mean, personally, I'm not very optimistic about him playing enough football for Manchester United at the end of the season to be to be fit. I mean, England don't have a lot of good options at left back. Um, I think Chilwell, I mean, we'll have to wait and see how Chilwell does in the, over the back end of the season with Chelsea. Uh, to be honest, I wouldn't be that surprised if he goes back to Kieran Trippier, who he has played a fair bit at left back over the years. I know he's not enjoying his best season with Newcastle United, but I do think that Southgate... Southgate will kind of be guided, I think, by tournament experience and by the players he can trust. So, And if it comes down to a coin flip between Chilwell and Trippier, my sense is he'd go for Trippier. Yeah, pretty much the same, to be honest. I think I think Maguire will, I think Maguire will be the choice. Um, do I want Maguire? I, I'd like to... I think England's a different environment, it's a different setup. So I like the idea of Brandwaite coming in and moving John Stones to the right side. I agree with Jack about Shaw. I think the left back's interesting because left back was always such a strong you know, position for England. And I think if you've got Chilwell, who's who's injured frequently, Shaw is more a form question. I think Jack's right. It's it's interesting that that's now potentially a problem. It may not be, but let's see. Um, but yeah, I think I think I think Tom's overall quite right. It's quite it's, it's, it seems settled, even though I think it's probably one of the most debated positions. And I wonder if someone like Conser or Brantwick can make an impact even if there is that short amount of time before the tournament. I guess, I guess there's a difference between uh, getting to a tournament and competing in it and then actually having real hopes of winning it in terms of the experience you call on or, or not. Uh, midfield, I mean, Mainu feels like a player that <laughs> has a really good opportunity to stake a claim here because, as you say, the, the lack of maybe covering midfielders. And I presume we're all playing Jude Bellingham in a kind of a 10 role. Yeah, so I think I think two of the three, assuming we've got three in the midfield, I think two of them don't even need to be talked about, and they're Bellingham and Rice. They will definitely, definitely, definitely start every game for England at the Euros. Who you have alongside them, I think it kind of depends on what... It's, it's not even so much about like the quality of the player, it's about what sort of a player do you want in there. Do you want, you know, we talked about, do you want a number six to release Rice to go forward? Do you want someone who can create more chances, like a Madison? Do you want more physical energy, like a Gallagher? Do you want Alexander Arnold in midfield? Which is something that South, I mean, Alexander Arnold isn't in this squad, but he is, that is something that Southgate has tried at, at points since the Qatar World Cup. Um, and I, I wonder whether the answer. I mean, there isn't a really an answer to this question because I think it will probably depend on what sort of opponents England are playing. Like, is it a game? Is it a game against I don't know a Denmark or a Serbia in the group where it's all about trying to unpick a, a really organised opponent, or is it a game against? I don't know, France, for example, where England got picked apart by Antoine Griezmann in the World Cup quarterfinal in 2022. And they're probably thinking they do want a bit more physicality in the form of a Phillips or a Henderson. How about you, Tom? Yeah, I'm very much along the same lines. I mean, I'm wondering even if Phil Foden could maybe play in that midfield and that allows Marcus Rashford to to take the left-sided attacking spot. And that is a kind of ultra-attacking um, option if we're playing a team who we're looking to pen in and really have someone in between the lines like Foden. He's so good at kind of receiving it in tight spaces and drifting away from pressure but yeah it's really tricky but Rice Bellingham and I think I would go maybe for James Madison if I'm forced to pick one but yeah it depends on the game I think Similar thinking to you actually there Tom I, I like the idea of having Bellingham and, and Foden mm. and I like the idea of Foden playing centrally because I think we've seen for City for long spells this season how effective he can be there but then yes that allows Rashford to play but Rashford's form has been up and down this season I think you need I think having someone like Rashford on that left-hand side who can cut in and take advantage of the spaces that Kane can leave is, has quite a nice balance. But as you say, it's quite forward-thinking. I would really have liked to have seen Trent in that role, really see how that would have progressed. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those who... 
you know, we look at the two best teams in England, Liverpool and, and City, and they and the way they set up their teams and the way that they use defenders like John Stone stepping into midfield or Trent stepping into midfield. And you you kind of want England to reflect that. You want England to reflect the best that the Premier League has to offer. And I just I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if one England necessarily have the defensive players to cover in that in that role. I know we talked about so I look at the ones I've got. So Walker, Maguire, Shaw as a free say and then you had Stone stepping in and then maybe that can release Rice a little bit and you get a box and that might suit Bellingham it might mm. suit Foden play with more freedom but then that might even be a question about Southgate and whether he can do that whether he wants to do that whether he's able to do that and, and I think that maybe this is a separate topic but that might be part of why there is that sort of criticism with Southgate thinking well, he, is he able to do it? I was at the England-Australia friendly at the back end of last year and he did do that with Trent Alexander Arnold and he was allowed to push more forward obviously in, in that environment and mm. England roared on to an amazing 1-0 mm. win in a, <laughs> in, a, in a dead friendly um, but, so, so he is obviously trying it you get such limited opportunities to do it of course the, the other thing I noticed from that first half was James Madison was playing in that game but so was Grealish and it, it all got very cloggy and I, I fear there's so many great ball playing players that that can happen maybe if it's not quite right and the chemistry is not there and that does make me think about James Madison because I love him as a player but you kind of wonder if he gets a little bit pushed out of this maybe um, how has his form been at Spurs since he came back well he, he was incredible in those first 10 games of the season like he, he really hit the ground running and looked like he'd been playing for Tottenham for years but he then suffered that bad uh, ankle injury in the game against Chelsea in November which put him out for almost three months, which I think makes it the worst injury he's ever had. And since then, he's had some good moments. You know, he scored a fantastic goal away at Villa Park where he really showed his athleticism to get on the end of a cross from Saar. He had some really good moments actually in the game against Fulham where Spurs overall were, were pretty bad. Um, I, think, I still think we're waiting to see the kind of Madison of the autumn again now, although there's still, you know, there's still a lot of football left this season, so I hope there's no reason he can't get back to, to that level. Where he fits in for England... I don't know. I mean, for Spurs, he obviously plays in. He plays as an, an uh, he plays as an attacking number eight in a four three three system. And he's given quite a lot of license, but I I just don't think. I mean, Southgate and Postecoglou are just quite different tactically. So I don't think I would be surprised if Southgate allows him to replicate his Tottenham position for England. I mean, recently for England, I think we've seen Madison playing from the left, like in a kind of Grealishy type role. And I my my sense is that. Madison's role for England is a kind of alternative to Bellingham as a 10, an alternative to Grealish or Foden out on the left, rather than being somebody who can be trusted right in the middle of the pitch. It's, it's Madison, Madison's sort of the player you want to build around, right? You want your forward line to have him on the ball, to dictate things, to control things. And I think with England, you've got Bellingham in such fantastic form and you've got Phil Foden in there. There comes a point where you've got so many that you can't really just... Yeah, you, you can't, can't play can't everyone. Have that influence. And I think one of the best things about Southgate is he's quite clear-headed about the idea mm. that you can't just squeeze in all your best and most popular most famous players like for years England managers have failed because in large part because they have thought well you know we've got to get Wayne Rooney in somewhere let's play in midfield mm -hmm. like Hodgson did in Euro 2016 and it was a disaster or the whole like Lamp Lampard and Gerrard stuff so I do think one thing I really trust Southgate on is his ability to know what makes a good international team and pick the players accordingly rather than thinking, you know, what players do people like and then trying to trying to reverse engineer a team around that. Any bits, Pete, Tom, that we're missing from your 11s or are we all covered off? Harry Kane obviously up top, presuming he's fit. Mm. Fingers crossed, everybody, in mm. England. And anyone else in the 11 that we haven't mentioned or are we all covered off? Bukayo Saka's. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was the name I was yeah. plugging for there. Yeah, um... I mean, he's, yeah, he's been fantastic for Arsenal, part of a team that's competing at the top end of the Premier League. And um, I suppose the left side is the sort of the more open one. I think mm -hmm. if I think if with form you'd just put Rashford in there, but you've got Foden that can play there. You've, yeah. <laughs> you've got a list of players. You mentioned Madison as well. I would be. I think it's. It feels to me pretty locked to be Kane through the middle with Saka and Foden either side of him. Uh, they've, I mean, Saka's played almost every game for England really for the since he came into the team during during the Euros last time three years ago, and Foden has increased has played more and more and more for England on that left hand side. It's, it's funny really because that really shows the evolution of the team more than anything because you know for for years it was Kane and Sterling or some maybe sometimes depending on the formation Kane Sterling and Rashford and there was a huge kind of public campaign to get Grealish in during the during the last Euros and he did get in and he went to the World Cup but didn't really shine at the World Cup and now 
you know, the personnel have changed to the point that really I think it's Foden and Saka are, are locked in as starters either side of Kane. And then Rashford and Grealish are pro- maybe even competing for one spot in the squad. Um, and uh, Sterling unlikely to be involved at all. So it's been a big change in the guard. Yeah, and I do like the options that England have off the bench as well in these kind of situations because, like you say, if that is the front three that's locked in, you've got Cole Palmer sat on the bench, who actually as well, um, nine out of nine penalties in his professional career, so maybe that's something that could come into play. Ivan Tony as well, we've all spoken about his penalty record, so there are ways that Southgate can switch things up mid-game and in, in kind of tight contests, and I think that's always, always a good thing. I love the idea of Palmer as a kind of game-changing substitute mm-hmm. I think he's got exactly the right skills to do that like England have got one problem that England have had over the years and it's not quite so bad now is they don't really have that many players apart from Kane and Sterling who, score, who can score goals like even like like Grealish has played a lot of times for England he's not really scored that many big goals I can't really remember him scoring any any big goals for England whereas Palmer's got such an incredible like innate knack of knowing knowing where the ball's going to drop in the box, like a kind of real technical mastery of all sorts of different types of finishes. I think he's exactly the kind of player, if we're sort of gummed up nil-nil against Slovenia or whatever, and they need something a little bit different, I think Palmer, you know, ahead of Grealish, maybe maybe even ahead of Rashford, depending on form and fitness, is, is the guy who you would throw on who would somehow just magic something up in the final third. True. As long as it doesn't happen on 83 minutes, that will be all right. Um... <laughs> First big question that I'm going to ask at this point is, do we all agree that England can win this tournament? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. happy with that? Yeah, of course they can. Will they? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a very, very different question. Uh, I think they have, I would probably make them favourites, yeah. I mean, I, I, but obviously like the favourites for a tournament has what? Tom, you know this, like a 20% chance, 30% chance of winning? <laughs> yeah. How would you rank them in percentage terms? Yeah, just because it's so game by game. I mean, you look at the last World Cup, obviously France were the favourites. England were also in there as well. That quarter final went the way of France and then the final goes the way of Argentina. It, it's all so just big, big games and those are more or less 50-50 in those kind of occasions. So over the course of a tournament, yeah, it comes down to who draws who when they play each other and, and the kind of tactical decisions within those games. And I've already mentioned it once, but I can't help thinking like Italy only just scraped by in terms of qualification. Yet the fact that they've kind of won it before, <laughs> you're like, uh, it was, you know, England have won one major tournament in in history. <laughs> I, it's, but maybe that's just my psychological bias that it doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I, I think experience matters. I know it gets talked about a lot, but you know, England have been to a semi final, been to a final of, this, of the Euros. Um, you've got a squad there that's had that that know-how, that now, even at the younger age groups as well. You have the coach who's had that experience. You would hope that by being there in that environment, experiencing it can make that little difference that can be the difference in these individual games because it, you know, it's knockout football, isn't it? You could just get a red card after 10 minutes and then you've got the, a David Beckham incident and then, and then you go out. So like, it's, it's, it's one of those, isn't it? So in terms of, you know, you look at the quality that England have and we just talked about Cole Palmer as almost a new option, I suppose, that England now have as well. He's one of many that they can turn to, particularly in those forward areas, to change games, to win games when they're not going right. And I, that, that makes them, a, that makes England a real, real favourite. England are in Group C and they will face Slovenia, Denmark and Serbia. Who, am I right, Pete? You covered the uh, Serbia in the I World did, Cup. I did. Yeah, I did a, a nice big feature on Alexander Mitrovic, who... Julie left Fulham for Saudi Arabia. Oh, what um, did you write in it? Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> say your um, is that a tricky? Is that a really tricky first game? Do you feel? Oh, Serb- Serbia have multiple issues with major tournaments. Um, a, a country that has a lot of talent, particularly in forward areas, but then seem to fail to deliver. I mean, even, even at the World Cup, you know, they had some fantastic players across their squad: defense, midfield, Milinkovic, Savic, Mitrovic in attack with Vlahovic, Jovic. Um, they're a difficult team, but they just don't seem to put it together in tournaments. So it could easily be a, a banana skin, but it could easily be a game that they they implode in. So um, yeah, not not I, because of that unknown, you probably don't really want them, but they got them. So well, got have them. to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jack. One I want to touch on really quickly: uh, Gareth Southgate is contracted until December. So in theory, this could be his last tournament. W- what is your feeling at the moment that could happen after this tournament in terms of both England and Southgate? I think it depends a lot on how England do. So South, uh, Southgate was speaking about this on Thursday at the squad announcement at Wembley, and he said that he they have consciously shelved all contract talks before the Euros because he wants he thinks that if 
you know, if it becomes a big story about his future, will he, will he, won't he sign a new contract? He's worried that that will dominate the whole preparation for the tournament. He doesn't want the players to get distracted. He doesn't want the players to get asked about it, I imagine, which is what would happen if this was the story dominating the tournament. So no talk about the future until afterwards. I do think, look, I think, I sense like that the FA would like him to, to stay on, as in to sign a new deal that would take him to the 2026 World Cup. I think that he... I think the better England do, the likelier it is that he will sign. Um, I think if they win it or come close to winning it, I'm sure he would want to be there in the US to try and win that World Cup. If they're bad, which I don't think will happen, but we've got to be prepared for the possibility that they're bad. If they're bad, I think the public reaction, regardless of what the FA might think, I think the public reaction would be so angry because ultimately I think the public is turning a little bit or has gradually turned against Southgate over the last few years I think the public reaction would effectively make his make the make, make the minds up for them and that would be the end of it um, so yeah it's all to be decided in Germany really France then they will be one of the strongest teams in the competition clearly they've won the Euros twice in 1984 and 2000 they were a penalty shootout away from winning the World Cup in 2022 and that would have meant them retaining their title from 2018. I think they have all the experience I would request of a team that could go very close. Uh, they've got uh, friendlies coming up against Germany and Chile over the next week or so. Didier Deschamps still in charge. Peter, how are they looking? They're looking pretty good. Um, no major surprises, at least coming into this international break in terms of the squad. Um, Kingsley Coman's out at the moment with a, a slight knee injury, but you'd imagine that when he returns, he, he'd come back in. Um, Musa Diaby of Aston Villa's got the nod, uh, his first call up for a year. Um, there was talk potentially of uh, Bradley Barcola, who's been excellent for PSG, uh, getting his first call up, but he's with the 21s. It feels like with Deschamps that he's, you know, he's, he's been there for, for 12 years now. I think coming into this tournament, he has a good idea of his squad. Um, there's so much experience across that team um, they know how to win tournaments they know how to go deep in tournaments uh, they have a world class forward in, in Kylian Mbappe but they have the, they have equivalent depth options to, to England um, it, it's a France it's a France squad that's changed um, they're evolving then because you, get, as you say as soon as you say Deschamps has been there for 12 years you're like well this could be like end of the cycle stuff yeah so there's only nine players in this current international break squad that were in France's Euro squad that kind of underlines the the changes that have been made there's no N'Golo Kante anymore there's no Paul Pogba of course um, Hugo Lloris has retired um, there's some big changes as well and you've got a new generation coming through as well the likes of Warren Zaire Emery is the, the youngest he's he's come into the squad his first cap in November scored he's a phenom phenomenal midfield player and that's joining a midfield that's already got Chouameni Kamavinga um, Rabio as well, um, yeah. So all in all, yeah, they're in a they're in a good they're in a good spot, and they absolutely breezed qualifying. Um, won nearly every game, and then drew with Greece to all, and just sort of ruined it, which would have been quite a nice. Thing, you know. <laughs> I mean, on paper, do you, do, are the squads quite evenly matched between France and England? Do you, would you want to put one down as stronger than the other? I think where France will probably have the edges in defence, but even then, you still have a few question marks about what it what they're squad will look like. Right back's been a bit of a, a question mark for France. Um, during the last international break it was Jules Condé and Jonathan Klaus. The two of them have both been called up for, for this break as well but neither have had amazing winters. Condé in particular struggled at Barcelona. Um, Deschamps prefers uh, Benjamin Pavard as a, as a centre back now rather than the right back. Um, but there's depth, you know, there is depth in those positions. Um, Canate's come, come back into the squad, Pavar's back after injury. William Saliba, of course, who's central to, to Arsenal. Um, I think we saw his influence at the back end of last season and, and how much they missed him. Um, he's established himself now, so has Dio Pamacano. Um, yeah, it's, they've got a lot of options. Um, Luca Hernandez can play at centre-back as well. His brother Teo Hernandez can play. So, um, yes. Can they, are they equivalent? Yeah, I think that's probably the problem area. And I suppose you, you, you might go, oh, they're still using Olivier Giroud as a centre forward, but Olivier Giroud is France's all time leading goal scorer and remains incredibly consistent for his country. Um, still playing for Milan, and um, they have options if he doesn't play as well. 
are, are players like that important, Jack, to a squad? Uh, Olivia Giroud, 37. Jordan Henderson, I mean, he could be with England, 33. Uh, do you need those th- those sort of key individuals in terms of experience in a squad like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think you need... Look, I think there, there's two reasons. One is that from a sort of squad harmony perspective, you want players who travel well, who are you know good tourists in inverted commas, who knit or you know who who are kind of don't mind if they have a slightly different role within the squad perhaps, or who can just bring everyone together and make sure that everybody is sort of singing from the same hymn sheet, that kind of thing. So there's that, and there's also kind of connected to that. There's the fact that international football is just different. It's different from club football, and the, it's kind of different tactically. It's slower. It's it doesn't have the same kind of high level combinations that it's kind of less synchronized. I think ultimately than than club football, and so because the demands are different, you can play in a slightly different way. And so while I don't think that a team who is trying to win the Champions League would have Olivier Giroud up front anymore, uh, he can clearly you know, be incredibly effective at international level. So I think there there is a big place for some you know for players like that. And I think Southgate's testament to Henderson, even when he was playing at Al Etifak, is is part of that too. Giroud's records are amazing, isn't it? And all of his silverware. I bet that's a heavy, hefty mantelpiece he's got at home. Yeah. Uh, France's group is is a bit tricky and it's not complete yet. Group D, they have drawn Austria and the Netherlands and then one other, which will be figured out over this international break through the playoffs, which is very exciting, obviously. Tom, do you, where do you re- do you see France as your favourites? Marginally over England. Um, again, it's it's very tricky, but um, I just think that star factor of Mbappe. I mean, we saw it in the World Cup final, which obviously they didn't go on to win, but he scored that hat trick uh, just out of nowhere, really. Um, England obviously have Kane and Saka, but to perform at that level at that kind of occasion, I think Mbappe is probably one of the only players in the world, alongside Messi at the time, who can do that kind of thing. And yeah, like Peter was saying, I love the kind of uh, flexibility that we have in defence as well. I think Saliba and Canate is, is an amazing partnership. Teo Hernandez is a very attacking left-back. They've got Pavard, who can kind of play a more kind of centre-back, punching passes through through the lines kind of role, who's done that really well at Inter Milan. And yeah, I'm very excited for Zaire Emery, actually. You mentioned him, Peter. You've probably seen quite a lot of him at PSG, but he looks really, really exciting as well. I'm already getting excited about the summer. This is, I'm loving this. Uh, right, uh, if you thought a week of internationals would mean no trivia, <laughs> you're wrong. Uh, for this one, we're going to give you, guys, uh, two international players, and you have to guess which player has more caps for their country. So uh, you're going to get two each, and you need to tell me which player has the most or more caps for their country. Makes sense? Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Jack, I'm going to come to you first, you lucky guy. Uh, this is uh, England. Marcus Rashford or Gareth Southgate? Marcus Rashford. He's gone with Ra- Marcus Rashford. And you would be right. Do you have a guess at the number? I would guess... <laughs> no points, but... I would guess Rashford has in the region of 50 to 60, and I would put Southgate in the region of 30 to 40. Oh, and now you're just showing off. Uh, Rashford, <laughs> yes, was correct. 59 caps. Ooh. Gareth Southgate, 57. Oh, wow. So producer Mike made sure they were particularly so that, tight. tight. That, was, that, was, that was closer than I thought. Which bodes well. Uh, Peter, I'm going to come to you next. It's England again. Danny Welbeck or Michael Carrick? That's Danny Welbeck, isn't it? Danny Welbeck, who played so often in Carrick, did them. It is Danny Welbeck with... <laughs> with Oh, I don't know. He doesn't know. 42. You don't have to ask him about this. It's going to be a long something on ridiculously low, like 15 or something, isn't it? Well, it's not isn't quite. a great scandal that Carrick didn't play more? Well, 34. 34. 34. So it depends on your definition of 34 more than us lot. Uh, Tom, England once again. Robbie Fowler or Ian Wright? I don't know. I think Um, I've got this one. (laughs) I've seen all the answers, so I can't guess. I'll say Robbie Fowler. It's Ian Wright. It's Ian Wright, right, right, with 33, uh, who I always remember for... Did he score? Oh no, I'm going to say something that's not going to be right now. I'm sure he scored in the game at, when England went 1 0 down to San Marino in San Marino. And how many did. How uh, many anyway, yeah, 33 caps, Ian Wright. Yeah. It's be- amazing, really, isn't it? It shows how 
different the 90s were that Fowler was I mean you guys are too young to remember this so I'm going to have to patronise you but <laughs> Fowler like Fowler was unbelievable centre forward for Liverpool unbelievably good natural finisher and Ian Wright was obviously also a brilliant brilliant number nine first for Palace or f- for most prominently for Palace and then for Arsenal and they were never really first choice for England they were n- they never neither of them ever were first choice for England at a major tournament I don't think because obviously when they get to 94 then 96 they had Shearer and Sheringham and then 98 again it was, was Shearer and then Owen as well coming in and so you had these it was an amazing era in hindsight that you could have players as good as Fowler and Wright who were you know they'd be getting into England squads but they'd never really be the main man for England over a consistent period of time that's because it. the competition was so good and that's even before you get on to you know Andy Cole Chris Sutton tons of Matt Letizia is obviously the example that people talk about a lot in this context but there's so many other examples I, I think you want a whole podcast on this one don't you Jack but yeah uh, Robbie Fowler 26 caps yeah. He got to Ian Wright's 33. Right, question two. Uh, so um, it's 1-1. One, one, it, yeah, that's fine. It uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, Tom. doesn't matter. Uh, Jack, here's your second go, your second bite of the cherry. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's our last England one. It's a battle of the Jamies. Jamie Redknapp or Jamie Vardy? I'm going to go for... That's really tough, actually. I'm going to just go for Jamie Redknapp. It's Jamie Vardy on 26 caps. The door has been left open. Uh, Jamie Redknapp managed only 17 caps and probably 17 shots from outside the box. (laughs) Over the bar. Question two, uh, Peter. France. Kylian Mbappe or Frank Ribéry? That's that's going to be close, isn't it? Um, They're both quite high. Mbappe. It's Ribéry with 81. Mbappe with 75, but he'll obviously overtake that. Uh, So we're all on one. Tom's your chance to make sure it's a draw and complete waste of time. (laughs) Tom, it's Germany. Oh. Oh. (laughs) Gerd (laughs) Muller or Jerome Boateng? You're going to go Boateng? Boateng. It's right, 76. (laughs) Muller on 62. Uh, So it's a a draw. Everyone is a winner. And that is how life should be unless it's the Euros. (laughs) Right, our final part then, we should uh, touch on any other potential favourites. Uh, obviously, some of these groups aren't decided, so we can't d- uh, dive too much into all this. But I think we should probably mention Germany, given Julian Nagelsmann's in charge for short term. and He's been doing some strange things, Tom, like playing Kai Havertz at left back and all sorts <laughs> of fun. Uh, and, and we don't know if Jürgen Klopp might end up as Germany's boss beyond this. But, uh, they, I mean, they've been a massive disappointment in recent tournaments this isn't the Germany we all knew where do you what are you expecting from them going into this one yeah it's a tricky one because there's not been a lot of stability going into this tournament um but as with all of the favorites really they do have so many really interesting young players coming through um I mean you look at that kind of particularly attacking midfield I mean Jamal Musiala and Florian Wirtz is wow I mean those two are two of the best players in Europe really in terms of being able to pick up the ball in the attacking third, being able to make things happen. I was watching Florian Wirtz actually the other day against Karabag in the um, Europa League, and every time he picked up the ball, he did something. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be interesting. And then they've got Tony Kroos sat behind them. If he's, uh, Is he back in the squad? He is, I he think. He's back in the squad. Uh, Gundogan has created the most chances of any player in Europe's top five leagues this season. He's been playing a bit further forward to Barcelona in recent weeks as well. Yeah, there's, it's, there's a lot of talent in there, but... Again, international football decided on, on single games. And, you know, we've even looking at their group, I mean, Hungary have been quite kind of barnstorming in the last couple of competitions and qualifying. Scotland, obviously, steamrolled Spain a couple of uh, couple of months ago. I mean, yeah, it's, it's one of those where they could either absolutely walk it or get bogged down into a little bit of a battle in, in that group. Anyone else anyone wants to mention? So much experimentation, isn't it, at the mm. moment? And you just, especially with a coach like Julian Nagelsmann and, clearly doesn't have his favourite squad, certainly doesn't have a sort of settled 11. There's a quality in there. You just, you always wonder when you're making that many changes heading into a tournament, whether you can make it click. Um, I suppose the adage is always, you know, you want it to be like a club, right? You have your ideas and everyone knows what they're doing, but... You know, it's, you know, it's international football, isn't it? It can be a bit wacky. So maybe it's <laughs> Love that, a bit wacky. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, most people might like the idea of an outside um, shot at 
Spain, Croatia, Italy, Portu- who are all Portugal. in the same group. Oh, sorry. That's okay, <laughs> Jeff. That's like Portugal too, but actually Spain, Croatia and Italy are yeah. all in the same group. Well, that thing is, that's kind of less exciting than it should be because of the 24-team f- format. If oh, this is yeah. the classic 16-team mm-hmm. format, then having three good teams in a group would be super exciting. When you've got 24 teams, and obviously, so that means, what, four out of the six third places go through, it's less, there's less of a sense of jeopardy about a group of death. Oh well, never mind. And Portugal too. <laughs> yeah, I would say I I might might have Portugal as being my third favourites behind England and France. I just think you know, like everybody's obviously got their, everybody will have their own opinions about Roberto Martinez, but the quality of players they've got is still really really good, even with the sort of aging Ronaldo up front. You know, the, you look at Bernardo Silva, Ruben Diaz, um, Rafael Leal, tons of players. Chapelinha. Chapelinia, yeah, exactly. Europe's Europe's leading hatchet man. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah, I, I would certainly, from an England perspective, not want them to have to play Portugal uh, too early in the tournament. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how Martinez has got them playing. Tom, you're going to see Spain in action soon, aren't you? Yeah, tomorrow against Colombia, which I'm quite excited about because Colombia haven't lost in over two years, I believe. So that will be actually quite a competitive game. I think they beat Germany as well in, in, in the last kind of round of friendly. So, yeah, I mean, with Spain, I think I'm always optimistic about them and it doesn't always turn out to be, you know, the, the right thing to do. But I quite like the fact that they've kind of settled into kind of four, fifth favourite kind of position. And, you know, not everybody is looking at them as really serious contenders. But I think there's some interesting things going on in that squad. I mean, if we're looking at these internationals, for example, at left back, Jose Luis Gaia and uh, Alejandro Bailey, they are both injured. So Grimaldo comes in, who's had an amazing season for Bayer Leverkusen, 11 goals and 15 assists. Um, there's also Kubar C, the young centre-back for Barcelona, 17 years old. He's been thrown straight into the squad. I think that's going to be really interesting to see because, yeah, that game against Napoli, he was really good up against Victor Ossiman. And some of the passes he can kind of launch through a team, it's, it's just unbelievable. So I think he's really exciting too. Um, and then up front, which I think is the biggest change with Spain really in the last couple of years, is that they've always had a kind of possession-based system where the wingers aren't necessarily destructive going forward. They're more kind of will come into the midfield and they'll link up. Now in Lamin Yamal, who's obviously very young, we'll have to see whether he's you know thrown in at the deep end. And Nico Williams on the other side, they have wingers who can run at you, who can take take you one, who can cut inside and shoot and score a lot more than in previous years. So I do think they have something different about them on top of that possession game with Rodri and then potentially Gavi and Pedri in the midfield. Will it still be Alvaro Morata up front? Probably will be, yeah. Um, he's been quite good this season as well, to be fair. I mean, he's a, I think it's his best scoring season now in La Liga for Atletico Madrid. They have Hossolu as a as a, uh, a bench option as well, who's been, again, obviously here in England, we've, we didn't see the best of him, but he's effective when he comes onto the pitch. He's got a good aerial presence. He's actually scored twice on his debut, I believe, for Spain, so... Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's not, you know, it's not, if you're looking at that squad, it's probably not shouting out to you that, you know, favourites, but I do think they have some interesting elements which might take some teams by surprise. How old is Morata now? He in his 30s, yeah, 32, I reckon. But, yeah. It's an interesting theme, isn't it? You've got Morata, 31, Giroud, 37, mm. Ronaldo, 39. Yeah. I think with Morata as well, I mean, this season, his main strength is his aerial ability, his heading, and... It, he's not really had consistent service this season I think there's also a really good article on The Athletic by uh, Dermot Corrigan who talks about he's uh, working with a mindset coach he's kind of cleared his head a little bit and he's also just really focusing on, on himself and really focusing on being in the central areas and he's scored so many headers this season as a result so yeah so there's, there's lots going on in that team and Luis De La Fuente obviously it's no longer Luis Enrique He's been working basically with the under 19s, the under 23s, under under 17s as well, all the way through since about 2013. So a lot of his squad he's actually worked with. So I think there's a lot going on. I think it could be interesting. I think like traditionally people might turn their nose up a bit at having a having a big team who's managed by someone who doesn't have much of a much mm. of a profile as a coach. But the more that international football gets different from club football. I think it actually makes more sense to have teams managed by someone who has come up through the system. Mm. And obviously, you know, Southgate's a bit higher profile because he managed Middlesbrough and he was a fairly fairly famous player. But you can definitely see the parallels between De, De La Fuente and Southgate. And, that, you know, even like one of the most successful international managers of recent years, Joachim Löw, who, again, had a bit of a club club management career, but ultimately owed his rise to working through through the 
through the National Association. So even though I think some people will say, oh, who, you know, who is this bloke who's managing Spain? I've never heard of him as a player. I think though, I think that is just the direction that international football's going, mm-hmm. and it might turn out that he he's kind of more rooted in the job than as like a bigger name import from club football. Well, we'll have loads more preview content of Euro 2024 as we draw closer to the start date, which is the 14th of June. So make sure you keep an eye on the Athletic app and website. But that is all for today's podcast. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure. Io will be back on Monday and we'll be back next Friday as usual. In the meantime, thanks for listening.